emaciated ladies. You know, the co- uh, long parts of the coast, they were reporting tens of thousands of these, you know, literally streaming in off the sea and hanging around headlands and going onto thistles and things like that. Um, and it varies from year to year. That usually happens once every 10 years. You get this massive migration of painted ladies coming up um, on southerly winds, etc., from the continent. Um, and painted ladies will originate in North Africa and Southern Europe and then migrate up to the UK. But they don't necessarily do it all in one go. In some cases, it can be six generations. Um, so, you know, a, a painted lady will lay its eggs in North Africa. They'll hatch. Then a butterfly will move north slowly but surely and then lay eggs you know, in southern Spain, and then that one will move forward and then keep going and keep going until, you know, one generation crosses the channel and then comes into the UK and lays its eggs. Um, and that's where we can get a really, really big influx. We get painted ladies in small amounts every year anyway. Um, but what's interesting and what's relatively new with our understanding of this migration of these painted ladies, you know, marching north in, in various generations, is that when we get to our autumn, the painted ladies then head back south. And in some cases, those ones do a really long distance migration where they can, they'll might, but it was weird because no one understood this because during, during spring, during summer, you can see these butterflies migrating. You can literally survey, you know, and, and see these butterflies flying over the channel. You know, they're flying over at head height. It's easy to see that they are migrating north. But in the autumn, well, no one was seeing them head back over the channel. So where, if they just died out, well, how do you get the population back in North Africa or Southern Europe? And it was this mystery for years and years and years. And it's recently been discovered that these butterflies then migrate back at altitude. And they do that because they're slightly thinner. And these butterflies will migrate back south at average about 30 miles an hour, which, you know, will take them quite, you know, a little bit of time, you know, a good few weeks. But that's how they do it. Uh, and then they start the whole process again. But what I find fascinating with that is that the sixth kind of the, 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 the painted ladies that originally moved north from North Africa and Southern Europe to the one migrating back that way, that's almost six, could be six generations apart you know, from the original one that started that migration. So they are fascinating things. You know, we often think about swallows doing these amazing migrations. Our Lepidoptera, our butterflies and moths can do impressive migrations. Some will do a long haul. You know, the, in the case of the painted ladies, they often do a staggered migration, you know, over generations. Other species will literally fly up from Spain and France and Italy and places like that. And there's a great, there's a great guy on, on Twitter who um, predicts weather patterns and suggests what moths are going to turn up on the South coast from the, from the continent and things like that. So it's, it's, you know, these things are fascinating, you know, and you can get rarities turning up more, you know, and, it, and in recent years, there's been more and more of the case um, with some European species hitting the South coast and et cetera, and sending butterfly twitches, all over the place. In the gardens, however, you know, our painted ladies have, used to be a really familiar sight. Yeah, varies from year to year, but I'd say lots of our common orangey butterflies we get in our gardens, I'd say a lot of them are in decline, alarmingly decline. Now, for years and years and years, I've been quite conservative with thinking things are declining. You know, I've noticed they are. Um, but you kind of think, well, some things have good years and bad years. This year, I've been really alarmed. You know, the lack of butterflies in my garden is just very noticeable. Um, this spring, I did a, a butterfly survey for the North Wales Wildlife Trust for Grizzled Skipper, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, and whilst we were, we were surveying for that specific species, um, it was noticeable, the lack of common stuff to the point of where, you know, every time I meet another naturalist where butterflies come up, I'm telling people um, we need to be alarmed. There's something, something's really, really not right at the moment. Um, and it can give us false hope in the next coming weeks as this kind of is, is, is the kind of late July, August generation of our butterflies comes out, the second broods in some cases, because what we get is we get some of the 
species like small tortoiseshell, peacock, etc., where they, the adults will overwinter, they will lay their eggs, um, they will produce caterpillars, etc., in the spring that eventually become the spe- you know, the, the, the butterflies we're going to see in the coming weeks, etc. And you often that's slightly more than what you get in spring. And you can feel in August, it can feel like there's more butterflies about than there has been. Um, but it's it's a continual decline. You know, last year I had 30 small toss shells on, on, on my Budlier in the garden in one go. And you think, well, that's a lot. But in previous years, it was 50. It was 60. You know, so it's a continue a continuous decline. Um, Hillary's asking size of a painted lady. So big. It's a big of all, of our kind of commoner butterflies. It's kind of we'd say medium size. It's not as big as some of our really big butterflies, um, but I'd say wings wingtip to wingtip, maybe three inches, maybe yeah, maybe three inches. Certainly some of the uh, bigger females, etc. Small tortoise shells are slightly smaller. So a familiar um, butterfly of the garden loves things like Budlia, loves things like the Bina bonariensis which is a, a beautiful uh, plant to put in the garden to attract butterflies, loves things like Hebe as well. Um, and quite distinctive, very, very orangey with this beautiful kind of sky blue bordered all around, all around the wings. It's a beautiful thing. But I included this picture. It's not a great species to illust- illustrate the identification, but I'd like to show just how furry the abdomens and things of, of butterflies are. You can see on this one, it's, it's hairy. They're not... They're not smooth things. They are really quite hairy, um, as are some of the caterpillars of some of our Lepidoptera as well. Some of them are very, very hairy. Some of the hairy ones are really dangerous as well, As because when I was younger, I, got, uh, I picked up a caterpillar that was walking across our living room floor, and I thought, I'll get rid of that before the dog eats it. Put it out in the garden, thought I was doing that a favour. Two hours later, covered in a rash all over my body. Had to go to hospital. I was in agony. And it was um, from a vaporer, caterpillar, a moth. And if you're, you know, fair haired ginger, all the usual stuff where you're likely to have, you know, got to use non-biological washing powder and all that kind of jazz. Um, it, uh, the hairs are tipped with poison and it goes into the blood and goes all around your body. And for about a month, I was on incredibly strong antihistamine that would just knock you out. So to stop the itching, I basically had took these tablets that made you fall asleep. Um, this isn't the best of things, but uh, that's why you don't handle hairy caterpillars. Um, but anyway, um, there you go. That's a small tortoiseshell. This is a comma. I remember the first time I ever saw a comma back in Rochdale, where I grew up, um, and thinking, oh, dear, something's had a really good go at this. You know, some this little birds had a go and took chunks out of its wings. That's actually how it is. Commas, are, that's how they are. When they fold their wings and close them, and out there on a leaf, they're just perfect camouflage because they're a dark brown on the underside of the wings, um, and they just look like a bit of bit of leaf, broken leaf, etc. On the underside of the leaf, they have a little silver mark, which is like a comma, which is why they are called comma. Um, but when we talk about butterflies that have increased and decreased, because there are definite losers, definite winners, um, comma is one that was a winner and now seems to be a bit of a loser. So when I was growing up in Rochdale, we just didn't get commas. Commas were relatively new species to Rochdale, and we take them for granted now. So going back to the late 80s, early 90s, a comma was a notable sighting, whereas five years ago, if someone said, oh, I had a comma in the garden, you'd be like, and? It's like getting a blue tit in the garden. It's not a big deal. But that's that's because they, they'd really increased recently i'd say they've declined noticeably declined um but they were never the never numerous commas you know small tot shells often go around in gangs you know you don't just get one you get lots of them um commas are a bit more solitary you just get odd ones and twos and things um but they're a beautiful thing really really beautiful um and I, I think probably the only butterfly we have that has this weird jaggedy you know kind of scallop looking um wing which is really, really distinctive, very rich orange color um, with these kind of really dark, almost black spots. What we've got to remember when we're identifying butterflies is we are looking at the last hurrah. This is the adult form. 
we're obviously, it's already been, you know, egg phased, caterpillar phased, and then into the chrysalis, not a cocoon with butterflies. Butterflies don't make cocoons, they make chrysalis. Um, and during that stage, from when they go to a caterpillar into the chrysalis and then out as an adult, you kind of think, oh, well, the caterpillar just basically grows wings and that's it. It doesn't. When they're in this chrysalis or even the cocoon phase with, mo with moths, they almost turn into a liquid and then reform. You get this weird goo that they kind of almost turn into. It's real. They're, they're just weird and bizarre and amazing. And you kind of think, how, you know, how does it know what it's going to be? Or is it really surprised? That's what I get. You know, you get this caterpillar that just, just be like, oh, I've got to, I've got to do something now. I'm going to, I'm going to make a chrysalis. And then it comes out and is it like, wow, you know, that was a good sleep. Um, yeah, I just, I find it fascinating. The same with those painted ladies that what's driving them to move north. I mean, or you could say temperature, things like that, you know, but then all of a sudden that one decides to go south. You know, it knows there's something ingrained. And I find this fascinating. The same with birds and things like that. There's just a part to evolution that we just don't quite understand or quite, quite can't fathom. And that's what I find really, really fascinating. Um, so there's our comma. And then, of course, we've got our beautiful peacock. Peacock's probably the easiest of all of our butterflies to identify because it has these strike, you know, this beautiful red background with these striking eyes. And the reason they have eyes is to make yourself look bigger. You know, if, if you're something that's got eyes that are that far apart and that big, you're a big predator, you know, which is why things might give it a wide berth. Um, so, you know, it's not, we kind of, you know, I kind of grew up thinking butterflies have just evolved to be as garish and as beautiful as possible. And actually it's, it's all about camouflage, all about attracting a mate and camouflage and things like that. And even, even something as garish as a peacock butterfly, part of its camouflage, you know, if you can't mottle into the background, then make yourself look bigger, you know, and that's exactly what the peacock's done. It's made it look like it's got more eyes and, and big eyes. So anything look, looking at that won't see the butterfly, they'll see the eyes and think that looks a bit big. I'll give that a wide berth. Um, but incredibly beautiful. But again, this, this spring, I, was, I can't remember if I've, if I've said this to everyone or if I was, I was talking to, to Liam and Jess before we started, but the cold spring, you know, April was cold. It was sunny, but it was cold, really cold, because it kept a lot of our birds back as well. Because um, the bird watchers will know that's, that a lot of house martins, swifts, swallows, they were all really late to arrive. And they were late to arrive because it wasn't, it wasn't warm. And it was a lot of northerly winds keeping them pushed back into Africa. Um, so it, April wasn't warm. And then May was very wet, very wet. Um, so a lot of these things that appeared in, in, in that emerged, you know, mar late March, early April would have got a shock. You know, it just too cold to fly, too cold to find food, too cold to mate. Um, and this year, I think peacocks are really thin on the ground. Um, compared to usual, you know, it's still a common butterfly, but nowhere near as common as what I, you know, it's, it's having a bad year. You know, if, if Jeff said to me, can you go out tomorrow and get me a picture of a peacock butterfly? I wouldn't quite know where to go, you know, because it's easy to think, well, I'll just hang around the buddleier in the back. I haven't, I haven't had a peacock in the garden for, for nearly a month now. Um, and when I go out and about, I only see odd ones about. So I don't, I, I, I feel like some of our commoner butterflies are having a bad time. Just to, you know, to go from the from the sublime to the ridiculous, you know, obviously got our peacock there with the eyes. The butterfly on the left, that's a meadow brown, pro, one of our drabbest looking butterflies. Because um, everyone talks about moths being drab and boring. Well, can I introduce the meadow brown on the left there? Um, very drab and boring, but beautiful nonetheless. And you can see, we, you might be able to see, depending on how big the screen, if you're looking on a mobile phone, you might not, but uh, you can see on the meadow brown, the proboscis, you know, into the buddleia to get the, the, the nectar and things like that. That's how they, that's how they feed. The last of the common, kind of common garden um, butterflies that we get, this is the red admiral. So it's the same size, uh, it's slightly bigger than I'd say, than a peacock. Um, they're quite, quite large. Um, and they're just, they are stunning. 
really, really beautiful. This kind of um, orange stripe, which kind of starts off on the top wing and then curves round um, to the lower parts of the wings. And then at the, at the very base, it's got these little, you know, blue specks as well. Um, just a beautiful thing. But again, it seems to be really having a bad year. Red Admirals, though, fluctuate as well, because similar to Painted Ladies, some of them migrate up from, from parts of Europe. So some years, if you get strong southerly winds, etc., it can swell the, 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 the numbers that should be here um, to quite, you know, to make it look like there's loads and loads of them about. But this year, it definitely feels like it's, it's not the case. The same with Painted Ladies. We just haven't had the right weather conditions to push these things um, right the way over. Um, Alan's saying not not seeing a single brimstone or peacock or oh, peacock this year. That's you know, surely seeing so few butterflies this year. I'm generally not an alarmist in terms of you know, there's always something we can do in nature, but at the moment there isn't butterfly. Yeah, this is, we. <laughs> I wish everyone could see because it feels like I'll be preaching to the converted. You know, you you everyone here tonight is interested in butterflies or, you know, so I'm preaching to the, the choir here, but if, if, if the, if the average, you know, Joe blogs on the street were to understand how few butterflies were around, they should be alarmed because it's an indicator of other things. I always use the example. Do you remember when you used to go for a drive when you were young or, you, you know, going back 20, 30 years, and you get out and the car registration plate would be littered with little black in, little black flies and insects. When was the last time that happened? That's how alarmed you should be. You know, the fact that whenever I go for a drive, I don't have to wash the car because it's covered in insects, splattered here, there and everywhere. That should alarm everyone because how much must we have lost for that not to happen now? And then think of everything else that that was feeding all the swallows, all the spotted fly catchers and things like that. Yeah, need to be really, really, really uh, aware of it. However, there are some butterflies that are doing better than others. So I think year on year speckled wood, which is this one, um, that just seems to be just going becoming more numerous and heading further north. Again, you go back to the 70s and 80s and say you saw speckled wood in Greater Manchester, people would have driven to see it. It wasn't a common butterfly. So, you know, as we could say climate change, it, there's not one thing we can say what is causing the decline. You know, there's lots of things. There's lots of pressures. The same with increases. It's, it can be other, you know, there's, there's more, it can be more than one factor. Um, you know, increase in habitat, increase in food availability, the right weather conditions. Um, that's all, you know, and, and then you, they, they spread spread, uh, spread uh, further and further. But speckled wood, generally you are looking in woodland habitat or kind of hedgerows. You don't generally find them out in open meadows, you know, where you'd get your things like your meadow browns and gatekeepers and, and things like that. They want a bit of dapple shade so that, you know, you will find them in woodland, woodland glades and, and quite mature hedgerows. Um, and they're just this, this, this brown colour with slightly yellowy, creamy spots, you know, but really, really increased in recent years. And a kind of a bit of a stalwart. You know, if you do go out and about for a walk, especially in kind of woodland hedgerow areas, you can always rely on, on seeing speckled woods when everything else is, you know, when you're struggling to find your small toss shells and, and peacocks. These kind of things seem to have, you know, handled our weather conditions much better than, than other species. It can, can we leave this talk without ever saying the word cabbage white again? So it's a it's a it's a term that I try not to be elitist in nature. I try and get as many people engaged and, and passionate about wildlife. And I, you know, it, however we do that, there's very few things that I think, you know, Let's not do that. But the term cabbage white really irritates me. And I don't know why, mainly because it's not a species. So there isn't a species called cabbage white. There are a number of whites that some of them do have a preference for, for the brassica family. Um, but they, they come in different shapes and sizes, etc. And they can be relatively difficult to identify. But I'll show you the easiest one. And it's this one. This is the green veined white. 
And when it's got its wings open like that, it looks very similar to the small white and the large white. And just to give you an idea, the green vein white is probably slightly smaller than the small white and the small white is slightly smaller than the large white. But when you see one flying around, you've got nothing to compare it against. So you just see a whitish butterfly. When it closes its wings properly, you can see why it is called the green veined white because it's all along its, its veins, etc. It has this beautiful greenish um, patterning to it. That can fade as, it, as they mature because butterflies, depending on what species it is, as an adult, two months is good. If you can live two months, you do it, you're doing well. Other cases, it's four to six weeks. That's it. You know, you, you've got it. And that's the thing. Four to six weeks. If you get four to six weeks of really bad weather, that's your breeding season gone, which has a massive um, impact um, in previous years. Shall they say in wow, fab photos? Some of them are mine. I've nicked about three images uh, from a friend of mine called Roger Wilkinson because one of my hard drives was playing up and I couldn't get the images that I wanted off. So I'll quickly nick them off his Facebook page, but he's a friend of mine. He shouldn't mind. And I'm taking, I'm going to show him some rare mushrooms in, in return for, uh, in, in lieu of payment. Um, so anyway, um, but yeah, that's, that's the green pen white. Note as well, just by the by, the difference between butterflies and moths, which is really tricky, but generally butterflies have this kind of antennae. So it's a bit like a golf club. In a way, you know, you've got the, the stick with a club bit at the end. They're not feathery. Like I'll, sh I'll show you some moths that are very, very feathery antennae. Um, but that's generally a, a, a common trait of butterflies is they have this kind of antennae. The way their wings are hinged as well differentiates them between moths. But it gets complicated and I'll show you why in a bit. Um, but often people say, what's the difference between a butterfly and moth? And one person said to me, um well butterflies fly during the day and moths fly during the night logical except for the fact um there are more day flying moth species than there are butterfly species in the whole of the uk so it doesn't quite work but anyway so that's a green vein white probably the commonest of our whites um another common white we have um is the orange tip now you might be thinking well how could you get that wrong it's a white butterfly with bright orange wingtips, you know, hence why it's called orange tip. Um, but this is the male. The female is all white winged, um, but her underneath is very camouflage. You know, it looks it's very patterned and camouflage. -y. Um, but not all butterflies fly, fly right through the season. Some have two broods, some have three broods. You know, that's how efficient they can be. They can, you know appear in the spring, lay your eggs, have a middle generation in June, July, lay your eggs and have a late generation in August, September. Um, other butterflies will might just have one generation and our orange tips have had their flight season. They emerge late March if the weather's all right, certainly April, May. And it coincides with when one of their favorite flowers is in flower. This is cuckoo flower or sometimes called ladies smock and they lay their eggs on it. So some butterflies are very, very specific on what they're going to lay their eggs on. And um, orange tips love lady smock or cuckoo flower. They also like garlic mustard, which is another spring plant. Um, and they also like hoary uh, rockcress, which is another kind of springish plant. So their flight season is very much dictated by when their larval food plant is available. Um, so they... The interesting thing as well it, with, with orange tips, species like small tortoiseshell and peacock, the female will lay loads and loads of eggs on things like nettle. They love nettle. Nettle's a great plant for, for many uh, of our butterfly larvae, our caterpillars. Um, and, you, you know, you, sometimes you'll be looking at a, a patch of nettles and you'll see hundreds of butterfly caterpillars. Orange tips, you never get that. The female only lays one egg on each plant. And that's because the caterpillars are carnivorous. They will eat each other. And it's the, the females are so adapted to, to knowing whether there's an egg on the plant already that they can sense it through their legs, whether there's an already an egg on the plant they've landed on. And if there is, they'll move on and let them try and find another one. So the idea is there's only ever one egg on a plant. So then it can go about and eat what it needs and get fat without eating another um, orange tip caterpillar so it's quite clever 
quite clever, but beautiful thing. Um, Alan mentioned about brimstones. This is female brimstone and male brimstone um, about to make baby brimstones. And the, the brimstone's really, really distinctive. Uh, the male especially, he's bright yellow. He is brimstone yellow. Um, the female's almost white. She's a very, very lime, very, very pale lime green, but in flight on a sunny day, she looks white. So she is yet another of the of the cabbage whites that people lump together. Um, and the, the, you know, the male is this, this is, you know, brilliant yellow, um, but quite restricted in its distribution. Um, and certainly when I grew up in Rochdale, brimstones were a big deal. We just didn't get them. If you go into places like South Manchester, they're a bit more common because it's, again, larval food plant is, is more that kind of neck of the woods. It's the it lays, it's often its favorite plant, it's older book form. Um, which is certainly more of a lowlandy kind of plant rather than up in the up in the hills, etc. Um, so the butterflies have got to go where their where the larval food plant is. Um, but the brimstone, I don't think I've noticed any increase or decrease in recent years. Um, I'm sure Alan said he hasn't seen um, a brimstone earlier. So then, if if he's walking the same areas and he's not seen one, then it is a decline in that area. Um, but the, the way you see the male, it's very, very distinctive. Very, very distinctive. See, there you go. That's the large white caterpillar. That's why they're called cabbage whites. Because if you plant any of the brassicas out in your garden and you don't use pesticides, say hello to your new your new neighbour. You know, and you will get loads of them. Um, and I often, whenever I, my garden, my garden at the moment, I, we don't grow any veg. Um, but when I did in my other garden. Um, I never, never used herbicides, never used pesticides, a lazy, but obviously for the environmental reason, but I enjoyed, you know, I got more pleasure probably watching everything eat the veg I was growing than I would have got out of eating the veg myself. So um, when you see large white caterpillars like this, they're just, they're just fascinating to watch, aren't they? Fantastic. This is a common blue. So we get a couple of the blues locally. When you go further afield, there are a couple of extra blues. Just by the by, while I mentioned in blues, throughout the entire world, there are only five butterfly families. One of them is the blues. And there are more blues that aren't blue than blues that are blue, if that makes sense. So there are some species in the blue family which aren't blue. But this is definitely a blue. That's blue. This is the common blue. And common blues, again, they like slightly more lowlandy areas because their food plant is bird's foot trefoil. So wherever you get kind of what we describe as waste ground, which is can be a bit derogatory in the plant world. But when we say waste ground, we're in these kind of rough areas that are kind of not very grassy, but they are kind of quite meadowy with their, with their plants, etc. A bit rough, bit ready, often kind of brownfield sites describe this. Um, wherever you get those, that bird's foot trefoil, you get common blue because that's their larval food plant. So as soon as you see bird's foot trefoil, this low growing yellow plant, um, you always keep your eye out for the common blue where the male is blue. Look at this, it's like an azure blue. It's just stunning, isn't it? The female's brown. So same shape, same size. These are smaller. So compared to our peacocks and small tortoise shell, the blues are about half the size. So we're talking maybe an inch wingtip to wingtip, maybe a little bit more. Um, and, but the females, their abdomen still have a tinge of blue, even though the wings are kind of brown, their, their abdomens are still tinged blue, but then you get the brown argus, which is a blue, which looks exactly like, even the male looks like exactly like a female common blue, but with no hint of blue. Um, so it starts getting complicated. Um, so if you're in areas, Wigan, Bolton, kind of, someone mentioned Stretford before, it'd be perfect down there, then you will find um common blues everywhere else there is another blue to look out for which is the holly blue which unlike the common blue which loves to keep its wings wide open and see that beautiful blue color the holly blue doesn't like to as soon as the holly blue lands it wants to close its wings um and that's and that's how it kind of usually is now it's called the holly blue but it should be called the holly and the ivy blue because there are two generations of holly blues. You get the spring generation and the autumnal generation. 
Although where spring stops and autumn starts varies where you are in the country. But basically in spring, they like holly. I think, I think this is the right way. In spring, they like holly and they lay their eggs on holly. But the autumnal generation like ivy and lay their eggs on ivy. Um, so in spring, you look for them near holly. In, in autumn, you look for them. In spring, you look for them near holly. In autumn, you look for them near ivy. Um, but they wander. They move about. So some species of butterfly are very, very restrictive in where they go. Others like to roam around. Holly blues definitely like to roam. Um, so you'd often see them flying around and, and it, you can almost not notice them. They're that pale in the sunlight. You can almost miss them altogether. Um, but they're beautiful things. I think, again, another one that's done quietly okay over recent years, um, not a massive increase, but definitely hasn't declined. And I get more people saying, oh, I had a holly blue in the garden, which is a good sign. Um, so pretty things. Holly blues. This is a, this is one of Roger's pictures um, that I stole. Um, this is the small copper. So this is a, this is an example of a blue that's not a blue. So small copper, morphologically same size, same shape as the common blue, but has these totally different markings. And I'd say small coppers have definitely declined, um, getting harder and harder. One of these things that you just stumble across rather than going out thinking, I'm definitely going to see a small copper today. Um, but you just again with a lot of butterflies, it is interesting how many of them this orange and brown works for them. You know, a camouflage thing, a mating thing. You know, a lot of them seems to work. It seems to be a repetitive kind of um, color form. There are some really really beautiful butterflies we get locally. This is possibly my all time favorite we get. This is the green hair streak. And the green hair streak is another kind of spring specialty we get. And if you look in Greater Manchester, I think I only know this from Bilbury. So when I've seen it in, in East Anglia, it likes bramble. When I've seen it in Scotland, it likes gorse. Um, but certainly in the kind of foothills of the Pennines, it loves Bilbury. So when you get, get onto those, although depending where you're from, Bilbury could be known as Hortlebury or Wimbury. But Bilbury is its proper botanical name um so when you get up you know in april may when you get into the into the foothills and you see patches of bilberry just give it a, a cast your eye for these green hair streaks it never lands with its wings open so if the upper wings the, the opened wings of a green hair streak are kind of gray brown they're really really boring but it always lands with its wings closed and actually when you see it on a bilberry leaf, annoyingly, I've never got a picture of it on a bilberry leaf because whenever I photograph them, they always land on something. In this case, this is unfilled bracken it landed on. But when you see it on a bilberry leaf, it's exactly the same shape as a bilberry leaf. And even bilberry leaves in the spring have that little kind of yellowy gold edge to them as well. So when they land on the bilberry leaves, they just blend in really, really perfectly. And when they're flying about, you just see this kind of gray, small thing just flying around it doesn't you don't think you don't see the emerald green kind of look to it um but it's not the only hair streak we get locally we get one called the purple hair streak which loves oak trees and then we get this one which is the white letter hair streak which loves elms now this is a species that we thought had really really declined in greater manchester because its host plant elm suffered Dutch elm disease. So the late 80s, 90s wiped out loads of our Dutch, uh, wiped out a lot of our elm trees through Dutch elm disease. Um, so you kind of think, well, this butterfly is gone. And then it was in the early 2000s, someone said, well, maybe we should look for them, you know, and see if there's any around. So a few of us went out and looked at the remaining elm trees that were near some food plants. See, so it likes bramble and thistles and things like that. And lo and behold, there's loads of them about. But the thing is with white letter hair streak is that they can practically spend their entire life around a single tree. And most of the time they're up in the canopy. So A, you've got to find an elm. B, you've got to find an elm that's mature enough, you know, not a really youngster, kind of 20, 20 plus years old. Um, then you've got to find an elm that's near, that's got, you know, right near the base. You've got things like thistle or bramble, etc. Then you've got to have the patience to kind of wait and look up at the canopy and wait to see some fluttering of them 
which can take hours and hours and hours. There is a little trick I learned by accident to entice them down. And that's because uh, when I was about 15, 16, trying to photograph these, I was just, I was waiting under a tree and I spilt my Sunny D. If you remember that drink, I think it's banned now because it was so sugary. Um, but as soon as I, I spilt it, two butterflies came down from the tree and were straight onto the spilt Sunny D because they wanted, you know, they were like, this is great. This is really sweet, sugary. This is exactly what I want. And then if I poured a bit on the, on the lower leaves of the elm, it just brought them straight down. So it was a great survey technique to work out if there was white letter, uh, white letter hair streaks about it. Just grab a, grab a bottle of Sunny D and, and, and pour it on the tree and see if they, uh, see if they come down or not. Um, but apart from, again, like, like the, like the green hair streak, always with its wing closed, white letter, because it's kind of got a W on its side, white letter or a three, I suppose, you know, but anyway, that's why it's called white letter hair streak. Um, so highly sought after because it does require a bit of patience. You can't buy Sunny D anymore. Um, at least I don't think you can. Um, so it is, it's finding elm trees. That's the hard part. A really decent elm tree that's kind of got nice undergrowth um, nearby. So again, another, another winner, slightly boring, is the ringlet, and it is boring as uh, you know. It, it when you see it with its wings closed, it's got these nice the circles you can see there. They're replicated on the underside, and they're quite nice markings. But apart from that, it is a very drab looking brown butterfly, but has really increased, really, really increased. There you go, Shelley saying it's beautiful. I'm not one for talking and judging on beauty. Let's face it, this butterfly, we're looking back at me thinking, speak for yourself, mate. Um, this butterfly's got more hair on the top of its head than I have. So um, but it loves meadows. So if you if you if it, you know, in the next few days, if you walk through a meadow, you'll probably kick up some very browny looking butterflies. Ringlet is a is a real, real likely species now, but 10 years ago wasn't. You know, in Greater Manchester, ringlet was still notable as a species. Now it's become relatively common. That's how quickly insects can colonize areas, but they can also they can decline even quicker. Um, but ringlet have done have done really well, as has the gatekeeper. So three species, when you walk through you know, a nice grassy meadow, three species you're likely to kick up because you're the when they close the wings, they're almost invisible ringlets, gatekeepers. And the third species will be meadow brown, which I haven't got a decent photo of to show you. But basically, a meadow brown is in between a ringlet and a gatekeeper. So ringlets are all brown. Gatekeepers have this lovely orangey colour on the brown. And meadow browns have some orange, but not lots. But the other thing as well is that the gatekeeper, these black spots on either side of the top wings, have two white dots in them the meadow brown only has one white dot in them um so when you see the dots that tells you the difference between the meadow brown and the gatekeeper but the gatekeeper and the ringlet have done really well they're really really increasing the meadow brown has declined and again we don't really know why um when other species that like that habitat like that situation seem to be doing all right um so yeah that's that's a gatekeeper. Very, very pretty. It gets the name gatekeeper because you often find them around styles. You know, when you're crossing over a nice meadow with a style, that's where they like to hang around, etc. So they are they are the gatekeepers. And then we have the we call it wall, but I've always refused to call them walls because it just sounds odd. Wall brown is their more formal title. This is a wall brown. Um, because if you say if you if you just walk talking to the general public and you just say, Oh, I went, I went and I photographed a wall the other day. It's not you just it's not not very um not very appealing in terms of trying to spark a conversation, is it? Um so wall brown, this is a species that has seriously declined, really, really declined. Like in our lowland areas, it practically vanished. It seemed to retreat up. So this is the thing with climate change, is that it pushes things north. You know, we're getting more species, like things like speckled wood comma, they did well on the back of climate change. But there will be a point, and it might be 50 years, it might be 100 years, where, you know, if you've got the UK and you've got their line of how what their weather they'll tolerate, as that moves up the UK, there will be a point where they start declining from the south heading north, if that makes sense. 
but that so you get this south to north migration of butterflies as climate change happens you know trying to follow the, the weather etc but you also get an, an altitude change as well because some species want it to be a bit cooler or you know or, or in some cases the other way around but war brown seem to be declined from the lowlands and retreated up to areas they never were so again going back to rochdale we never got war browns up in around the upland reservoirs now it's quite a commonish butterfly around the upland reservoirs but it's been lost to the lowlands it's slowly making a comeback but no one could really explain i mean climate change is an obvious answer and it, it feels like a bit of a cop out at times you know when you can just say oh it's climate change there's other factors that play that we just probably don't understand but we seem to lose it and then now it's starting to come back so hopefully the you know it's turned a bit of a corner and is looking good for uh the future for our wall brown looks similar to a fritillary i'll mention fritillary shortly um but i just want to talk about the skippers before fritillaries and then i'll finish up talking about moths mm -hmm. this is a skipper this is a small skipper and skippers uh <sighs> they're not a butterfly now i don't care who you are and I've had this conversation with lots of experts, they're not a butterfly because the strict definition on the hinged wings of butterflies means skippers cannot be because they have this delta wing. They literally have one on top of the other, which is not right for a butterfly, but they have butterfly antennas. I think basically what the skippers are, are the, the link between butterflies and moths. You've got this kind of evolution going on and we're kind of in the middle of it. But strictly speaking, they are not a true butterfly and strictly speaking, they're not a moth either you've got this kind of weird thing however i like to think that the the moth uh, aficionado has just said to the butterfly guys you can have it because you've got barely anything else to look at you've only got 60 odd species in the entirety of the uk so have another have something else to look at but this is a small skipper and again there's another butterfly that's rearing its head around our neck of the woods kind of the northwest and into north wales and that's the essex skipper which is very very similar but the small skipper has the uh, in the antennae has little black spots at the end and browny kind of orange underneath the essex skipper wouldn't have the brownie orange underneath there's other slight variations as well um but so it's something to it's something to look out for as far as i'm aware there's no confirmed records of essex skipper in greater manchester although that is only a matter of time and it needs someone to be really thorough looking through small skippers. This is the small skipper. This is the large skipper. It is slightly bigger, and not just because it's bigger in the in the image. It is a, a slightly bigger, um, slightly bigger in real life as well. But it's not as neat in the wings. You know, the the small skipper, the orange uh, is like is filled in, and then it has like a brown margin, and then a cream margin around that. It's nice and neat the large skipper the orange has these kind of darker bits of orange that blend in it's not as neat and tidy it just doesn't have the same you know neatness to it as the small skipper does but yeah they're they're fascinating things with this this weird delta shaped kind of uh wing shape with one on top of the other they're fascinating things there are a couple of other skippers but not have don't have even though they're skippers they're not true skippers because their wings are, are hinged differently this is the dingy skipper we do get them in parts of greater manchester now mm. again and it seemed to have increased um and then it, that's as beautiful as it gets with a name like dingy skipper it's never going to be the most beautiful thing um and then this is the grizzled skipper we definitely don't get this in greater manchester but this is the moth i was surveying for over in north wales um this year which is in decline um it's kind of last place in north wales to find it um are you unmuted jess if i said describe what if i said that i was doing a survey for this in north wales um where do you think this would be what kind of habitat are you imagining this grizzled skipper this species that's in decline um i'm guessing like a um, up of the hills in top of the hills it's in a prison oh it's a, it's actually on the Wrexham industrial estate okay. um so it's not you know like of all the places to go and survey things yep yeah, in on the Wrexham industrial estate one of Europe's largest industrial working estates and in the grounds of Berwyn Her Majesty's prison Berwyn um 
but it's basically those are its last last strongholds in north in, in, in certainly in the northeast part of north north world um, it's actually uh, near where i'm uh, from um, is it it's where from I'm, where i'm from originally so that's funny <laughs> Is it? There I'll you have go. a look out. <laughs> well, it's it, one of the one of the things I really like about this is is that um, Wrexham Industrial Estate, the, the the map for it could be applied right the way across the country because we're getting more and more of these industrial estates. But actually, it's fantastic for wildlife, you know, because it's the, you just leave areas and just let it do its own thing, and they can support lots of. There's no reason going forward. There's no reason you can't have you know industry and nature working together that's the key but there needs to be legislation to make that link happen but yeah it's, uh, whenever we talk about going looking for butterflies it doesn't always have to be beauty spots you know um the butterflies go where their plants are and the habitat's right and that happens to be an industrial estate in, in this case um i will just throw in a picture of fertility this is a marsh marsh fertility um and I, whenever I see fritillary is a bit like orchids. Um, people get excited about the name, I think, more than what they are, because that butterfly to me, it is stunning in terms of the patterning on it. But I always feel slightly sick because I think 1970s lounge, it's got that kind of look and feel to it of, you know, really quite 70s you know very dated moth it's in drastic decline marsh you know quite a number of like things like heath fertility marsh fertility they're not doing well um but i've included it because it's fertility we don't get any of the fertilities regularly in greater manchester dark green potentially fertility in parts of, of of the southeast part of greater manchester but most of them as you know you go to places like the peak district or over into north wales or up to cumbria to see um some of the more specialist fritillaries. We don't need to worry about them today. Um, do, 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 do. Moths. Okay. Moths are brilliant. I'm not biased in any way, shape or form, but moths are fascinating. Um, and they're just as pretty and beautiful. And as I said before, there's more day flying moth species than there are butterfly species. So statistically, you're probably going to find more moths while you're out and about than you are butterflies. It's just some of the moths that you see are really small, micro moths. Um, but other ones are a bit more easier to see. These are six spot bonnets. Easy to see because they've got six spots on the wing. Yep, one, two, three, four, five, six. There is another one we get locally, which is called the narrow bordered five spot bonnet, which has five spots. So all you got to do is just be able to count five or six and you can identify the two species of bonnet we get locally. It is important that the other one is called the narrow bordered five spot bonnet and not just the five spotted bonnet. There is a five spotted bonnet, but it's confined to the chalklands of Kent and nowhere else. Because on the uh, and the Greater Manchester database, there are records of five spot bonnets, but they're mislabeled as there should be narrow bordered five spot bonnets. But anyway, but these are day flying moths and you often find, again, meadowy places, um, places areas where there's things like knapweed and thistles you'll see lots of these bonnets they're fantastic to see um and out during the day um i want to show you my garden so this is not the great image because this is the image i nicked off um right move when we bought this house so it often surprises people when i tell them i've had 524 species of moth in my garden so compared to I think I'm on 14 species of butterfly. So 524. That's my garden. That's what it was like when we moved in. Basically, the previous owner just put a load of bricks down to drive his car on, and that was it. So, and then I moved in, and then it started looking like this, the timber yard, because we installed a log burner, and yours truly has access to lots of logs and stuff. Um, the other half works at Chester Zoo, so whenever they cut stuff down, it often comes back to us. This was the garden then, and you think, God, this still doesn't look very good, but get, bear with me. It was pr slow progress in the garden. They're my log stores, all cut up nice and neat. Fantastic for spiders. Can barely use them for firewood anymore because it's too good for spiders. Um, with alpine roofs on top, with some really rare native alpines, things like spring gentian, Scottish primrose, some really rare stuff. Um, and then this was it back in spring. This is the garden now. So I have slightly improved it for its pollinators i hope you agree although there's less dandelions 
But then at the back, there's a load of dandelions in the field. So, you know, it's not end of the world. And at the front, there's a load of dandelions, which the mother-in-law, every time she comes round, is always digging them up and always having to tell her off to say, leave them. You know, they're my plants. They're not weeds. Um, but that's it. It's a mid-terrace. It's a mid-terrace garden. It's not that big, as you can see. I try to ram it through with as many plants as possible. Next door and next door, but one have astroturf down. There is no real plants in their gardens, um, which is a massive shame. Um, but that my, that little garden, 500, oh, I've come out of it, shouldn't have done, 524 species of moth. So far, that each year that goes by, that's increasing. Um, and there are ways of looking for that, for our moths in the garden. One of them is looking for leaf mines. So this is a leaf mine of... Um, of a, a little micro moth. Micro moths generally are very small, less than a centimeter in size. But that's not the strict definition because some micro moths are very large and some macro moths, which are meant to be big, are very small. So it's always the case whenever we try and pigeonhole um, nature, it doesn't work. So the definition between a butterfly and a moth, well, where does the skipper come? It's somewhere in between. The same with micro moths and macro moths. It doesn't quite. It doesn't quite work. Um, so, but little micro moths. They often do these weird things with leaves. So some of them mine. Some of them fold the leaf. Some of them uh, roll the leaf. They do all sorts of different things. But they can be quite host specific. This is on bramble, and this is a uh, leaf mine of a moth called the golden pygmy, Stigmella aurella. The next time you're passing a, a big patch of bramble, have a look for this mine um and but basically this mine you see where it's small there's a little white dot that's where the initial egg would have been laid and the caterpillar has gone into the leaf into the leaf not on top not on the bottom in the leaf and then it's eating its way through the leaf getting bigger and bigger and the mine's getting wider because it's the caterpillar is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and then it vacates it when it's an adult moth so with some of these leaf mines, they can be incredibly distinctive. Some of them, sometimes it's the frass, the poo, uh, with how it's, if, if it's down the centre of it's pushed to the side or things like that, that can be quite distinctive. Because when you get these mines on things like oak, they can be more tricky. And sometimes you'd have to collect the leaf and rear it through to see the adult to confirm what species it is. But if you look in your garden and you see these little things, it's something's enjoying your plants. If your plants aren't being eaten, they aren't part of the ecosystem. That's the way to remember it. Um, but it's not just moths that do this. Some flies do it. I've got some astrantia in the back and they're covered in leaf mines from a fly. That's actually quite exciting because I don't think there's any records for it in North Wales. And I, where I am, I'm just into North Wales. Um, although it's probably overlooked and no one cares about fly mines. There's a reason why these things are quite unusual is because no one recording them or bothered. Um, but... So we can look at leaf mines. That's one way. We can use lures. So this is the six belted clear wing. This is a beautiful moth, which has these clear wings. And there are a number of the clear wings. But for years and years and years, I'd never seen a clear wing at all of any description. But you can now buy pheromone lures for attracting them. And they have to be used right you know you can't just hang them out and leave them all day and things like that you've got to use them for a short period and what you're doing is just seeing if that species is present at a site and then recording it the recording it is the crucial part um and so you can buy a pheromone lure it's the way it attracts these but uh, these moths if they're around so i put one out in the garden and lo and behold it came to it. Not that surprising because where I am, it's in a bit of a stronghold for them nearby uh, on the estuary. Um, but this is a, this is a, a NB. It's referred to in the moth world, nationally scarce B. So recorded in fewer than 101 kilometers, uh, 101 kilometer squares in the entirety of the UK. So not rare, rare, but notable. Um, so sometimes we use pheromone lures. Pheromone lures works for other species like this emperor moth. Emperor moths are, you can see, feathery antennae rather than like a, like a butterfly has. This is the male. I've included a close-up because I'm adamant when you see the moth's wings up close, it looks like a tapestry. It's just beautiful, isn't it? When you see the eye up close. Um, 
But if you walk over the moors in kind of April, May, and you see something that looks orangey, fast flying, you might think it's a butterfly. More likely, it's this moth, the emperor moth. The male flies during the day and rests at night, and the female rests during the day and flies at night. And you think, well, that's that's got evolutionary disaster written all over it. Because if the male and female don't meet each other, then that's, that's not going to work, is it? But actually, when the female sleeping during the day, she releases a pheromone. And that attracts the males and the male comes and find her while they're sleeping and then mates and then job done. But we can artificially make the pheromone. So if you go up onto some of the moorlands and you want to survey for emperor moths, as soon as you put it out, if there's an emperor moth within 100 metres or so, it will just be on that pheromone lure like a whippet, you know, very, very quick and easy to, to, to survey. So as technologies kind of increase, so is our understanding of, of these species um and it's not when we talked about migration with the butterflies being this amazing thing some of our moths do it as well and in in the case of silver wise they can do a bit more of a migration than the painted ladies in terms of how many generations it takes but also the one on the right here this is called the diamondback moth that moth is probably no probably less than a centimeter in size and that migrates up from North Africa, Southern Europe as well. So if you think how small that is and the migration it undergoes, it's phenomenal. Once you get southerly winds, you know, at this time of the year, the moth, you know, meadows and things can be filled with, with these diamondback moths. It's just unless you're really looking closely, you just don't notice them. They're just this little, little tiny fluttery things that you wouldn't give a second gl uh, glance to. This silver Y is a very, very notorious migrant, gets the name silver y because on the wing it has a silver y that's why it's called silver y um but this is this is the main weight of how we survey for moths this is yours truly over my my pride and joy my moth trap and a moth trap is basically just a box filled with egg cartons with like it's shaped so it's funnel shaped in this case it's called a skinner trap it collapses so you can it's port supposedly portable but it's not um and then a bright light. In this case, it's a mercury vapor bulb, which you can no longer manufacture it under EU law because it contains mercury. So there's a shortage of these bulbs that I've got a massive stockpile behind me in the cupboard, uh, which should last me a lifetime. Um, but basically, mercury vapor bulbs give off an awful lot of, of light, but more importantly, ultraviolet light. So that's what moths are attracted to. They're not just attracted to light. They're, they're after specific kinds of light. Um, so when I'm sat with this in the garden um, in an evening, I have special glasses that I wear. That like, They're sunglasses, but they're not tinted, but they keep out a load of ultraviolet light. And, and strictly speaking, you should wear things like sun cream around it because it's it's like a ta it's almost as bad as a tanning, you know, kind of um, bed. So you're going to be careful when you, if you're using a mercury vapor, you can buy actinic bulbs, which are like almost like the stuff you see at chippies. You know, those blue lights that attract like the flies and things like that. They're a bit more like that, a um, bit more safe for the general public. But this is that's how it works. They're humane. These traps, we're not killing them. We're just they go they fly into the box and then we can monitor what's their numbers things like that and then release them generally do it in the morning where they're nice and docile and we put them into you know walk away from the site put them in hedgerows put make sure they're nice and hidden etc so the birds don't find them and in the trap you get wonderful species things like this is common so i guarantee everything i show you now pretty much you'll get in your garden, wherever you are. You've seen the size of my garden. I'm in a very urban part of Queen's Ferry in North Wales. It's very urban. Um, and I've got a small mid-terrace garden, that, you know, and that's it. Um, yeah, things like this. This is the elephant hawk moth. You'll, it's a common species. You'll get this in your garden. It's a big moth. If you put this in the palm of your hand, it's going to take up a big portion of the palm of your hand. Biggish moth. Um, and... You get other hawk moths as well, like the, the lime hawk moth, because it likes lime trees, but not exclusively. Um, very, very pretty. Very, very pretty moth. And there are other ha hawk moths as well. Again, hawk moths are like the orchids of the, of the plant world and the fritillaries of the butterfly world. Everyone's obsessed with them. The hawk moths are like, they're big. If you put them in the hand, they've got very sticky feet. So as soon as you put them in the hand, your hand's nice and warm. So you, they want to stay on you and they won't leave because... Well, 
you're nice and warm. And so if you try and get off your hand, they're really sticky. So you're just left with a it le- left by a you just got a new friend for the rest of the day, really. Um, we get the eyed hawk moth, the one on the top, because when it shows its hind wings, again, it's got the eyes like the peacock butterfly. It's a threat. It's look how big I am. You know, don't eat me. And then we've got the poplar hawk moth uh, down at the bottom there. Um, there we go. There's our elephant hawk moth on the right and our small elephant hawk moth on the left. You'll get, you know, you'll get these wherever you are in Greater Manchester, you will find all these species in your garden. Because that's the fascinating thing with butterflies. We can we can see during the day what's about and we can see if there's an, an increase or decrease with moths. You know, a lot of the time, what's what's lurking in your garden at night? You've got no idea about because I've said this before. Bees get way too much credit for pollinating plants. You know, everyone pins them up saying, you know, bees are the best and la da 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 Yeah, pull the other one. Moths are doing a lot of the legwork and they're doing it when you're asleep so they get no credit for it. Um, you know, along with hoverflies, hoverflies need way more credit than what they get. But anyway, um, so we get, I feel like I missed a pitch. There's our lime hawk moth again. And the diff- you know, the great thing with moths is there's, there's, there's quite a few of them that fly in the winter. So the one on the left is called the December moth although more commonly in November. But if you're a moth in the winter months, if you want to keep warm, that's how you keep warm. You'll wear your fur coat, you know, because that keeps you nice and warm. So even in the dead of winter, there's still, you know, a, a dozen or so species that could turn up in your garden. So moths, you know, although summer obviously is far better for moths than, than, than the other months. Um, so there's something all year round for you. The tigers, this is a garden tiger on the left and a scarlet tiger on the right. I mean, wow. I mean, if someone said to you, where do you think in the world these are from? You won't say, oh, these are Manchester. You get these in Manchester. You'd think this is this some from the Amazon, surely. But no, these are these are just lurking around at night, going about their business, pollinating your plants, you know, although not all of them do. Going back to the hot moths, some of these don't even have mouth parts. So some of the hot moth species, poplar hot moth, I think in particular, it doesn't have a mouth. So they eat so much when they're a caterpillar that even when they go through metamorphosis through the, in the cocoon, when they emerge, they have enough energy to last them whilst they're an adult. So basically you've got what is basically a sex machine. It all, all it is there for is, is to mate. It's not there to feed or things like that. It is there to mate. So you know, in some of, the, some of the cases with these moths, they have cut out, you know, why have, why have a digestive system and a mouth when at that stage of their life, they only need to do one thing, which is mate. So they're fascinating things. And then some of the moths, the camouflage is stunning. I mean, the one on the right, the buff tip. I mean, if I put that on a broken piece of a uh, broken uh, little birch twig, it looks exactly like it, you know, and the one on the left, that's called the Chinese character. Um, and Interestingly, in some cases where if a bird, you know, if a robin or a blackbird is really, really hungry and they will come into the moth trap very early in, you know, kind of at dawn, even when it's still darkish, um, they will just eat lots and lots of moths. But they leave things like Chinese character and buff tip because obviously it can't see them. They come up so well camouflaged. The bird poo mimics don't get eaten by birds. So there's quite a few moths like the Chinese character that are basically mimic bird poo. And it's because it's a defensive thing because birds won't eat them. So it makes sense. And even some of the, you know, a lot of people say moths are brown and dull and drab. Um, this is the spectacle. And, you know, if you look at it on face value, yeah, you know, you, people could say, yeah, it's a bit drab. Uh, I disagree. But when you look at it face on, he's got spectacles because they're not his eyes. His eyes are lower down and they're black. The things above are just, you know, some weird markings that happen to look like eyes, but just, and that's why we call it the spectacle. And again, some of the, some of the camouflage of these, this is, this is an, uh, an early thorn. Um, when they just land, they just look like thorns and just bits of trees and things like that, which is why during the day, you just don't see these moths. They are so well camouflaged. Even these moths are really well camouflaged because when you're on a bunch of green leaves, try f- finding the scarce silver lines on the left and the green silver lines on the right. Um, 
even though its name on the left is the scarce silver lines, it's not that scarce. I actually catch the scarce one more than I do the normal green silver lines. Um, so they're just stunning. Moths, you know, there's over 2,000 species of moth in the UK, you know, so there's a lot to go at. There's a lot of colourful things. There's a lot of very pretty things. These leopard moth on the left and the poplar kitten on the right, they're just beautiful. Um, you know, uh, this I'm going to put the moth trap on in my garden tonight, and I'm also going out into the field with a portable moth trap because it's going to be so warm and humid, it's going to be great for moths. He says, touch wood, fingers crossed. Um, in my moth trap in my garden, I'd expect by about 3 a.m., putting the moth trap on at 11, I'd expect about 350, 400 moths of about 70 species tonight. That's that's what I should get in my garden tonight in, in the trap. Um, that's how many moths are flying around, you know, but again, a lot of our moths, you know, winners and losers. There's always things that have increased things that have decreased. I've missed a few pictures there. Um, this is uh, again, going back to the brown drab stuff, because everyone says moths are boring and brown and drab and et cetera. Even the brown stuff, Really, really beautiful. Angle shades on the left, scorch wing at the top, and our pebble hook tip at the bottom, um, which is just a beautiful, beautiful species. When you see that, you know, and that's what they look like when they're hiding and trying to hide in plain sight, you know, on a birch tree there. Pebble hook tip. Such a beautiful thing. Um, and even our micro moths. So whenever we talk about... Um, Whenever we talk about micro moths, it sometimes turns off a lot of a lot of moth enthusiasts because they're small and people think they're quite difficult to identify. But when you see them up close, even the kind of the micro moths are really, really stunning. I mean, most of these, again, less than a centimeter in size. And just look at the variation in color you get with them and just they're just brilliant and pretty, etc. They're fascinating. Um, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful things. Um, and I'll leave you with this picture because I'm, I'm well aware I've, I've gone over what I wanted to, how long I wanted to be. But um, this is the only time my, one of the neighbors whitewashed pebble dash wall has ever looked appealing to photograph. Because when I was studying at, um, at, at for my GCSEs, I remember doing uh, in biology, learning about the evolution of the peppered moth, um, which has since been kind of debunked, I think. But anyway, um, and I often thought, how, how is a white moth that's peppered with black? How is that good camouflage? It doesn't, you know, in, an, in a natural environment. You know, that's on a, if that's on a green leaf, you're going to see it a mile away, aren't you? So I've determined that the peppered moth has only evolved to like whitewashed pebble dash walls because it's the most perfect um, kind of camouflage you could imagine i have no idea what what you know i've only ever uh, i've never seen them in the wild i only i only ever see them in the moth trap um so that's how well they must be because in the moth trap they're a common thing i get them every you know most nights i put i put the moth trap out i'd get a pepper moth at the right time of year but all the years i've been walking around never seen a pepper moth just resting etc so um so yeah anyway thanks for listening does anyone have any questions? Um, what I what I suggest is we'll leave the questions until Liam's done his bit of the presentation. You can put them in the chat, things like that. Um, and then once Liam's done uh, done his, then you can ask you can fire questions at Liam on myself. Um, so yes, I shall shut up now and hand you over to to Liam. I'll put the uh, poll up again, and we'll see what people think after that. No, so um, that's a lot for that presentation. Um, I'm just getting my up now. So, unlike, um, one sec, so, sorry, the poll just popped up. <laughs> so, unlike Dave, I'm not an expert in any um, sense of the word, but I am just passionate about the natural world. So, this is a presentation that I'm of called the quiet crisis which refers to the overall decline in insect populations you know and this is largely ignored um, in the news media and in general conversation and there are two very significant ways in which insects are declining you know the overall mass of populations which i'm sure 
is what Dave will find in his um, moth traps. But this by itself is a very inaccurate way to you know, measure the health of populations because despite their decline in numbers, there's still a lot of insects to count. So the more accurate way in which we um, measure the decline of insects is through the range and the areas of which they're found. Um, so as covered in the pre previous presentations, you know, butterflies and moths are moving further up north, not being found south. And there's been a lot of bee populations that were once found across the UK, but are now found in more and more small and isolated populations. And this inevitably leads to, you know, small isolated populations which cause inbreeding within the insects, um, which means they are less capable or resilient against other pressures that hum humans apply, you know, from herbicides, pesticides, to even electricity um, interfering with their navigation. Um, so, yeah, um, and so even though everyone on this call is very passionate about moths and butterflies, um, you know, and these are the species that get a lot of love as well as bees. Um, sorry, I've, I've kind of lost where I was there. Um, but if we let this, this crisis continue, um, it will lead to major crop failure um, across our, our food supply as three quarters of crops require insect pollination. And as Dave correctly covered before, you know, bees are not the only pollinators and the legwork's done by all the others that don't get a lot of love. You know, we have a lot of moth fanatics watching, but, you know, hoverflies, flies and wasps, which, you know, will probably be the most hated insect, actually do a lot of pollination. Um, and beyond just, you know, the top of the plant, you know, the, the fertilisation of the plants, um, insects are fundamental into the overall plant health as a lot of the terrestrial insects that again don't really get talked about um, are vital at recycling nutrients into the soil um, you know feeding the soil with nitrogen carbon all the stuff that plants need to be healthy um, and then beyond our own survival and our own food Insects are the base of all food webs. Um, they, you know, they are the base of the water, food and air ecosystems. And without insects, a lot of the other larger animals that we love and admire will disappear. You know, because either directly through consumption or indirectly through relying on other animals consuming them, they are the base and they provide the energy throughout the entire food chain. So, you know, without insects, the diversity of both the human and natural world would be slowly destroyed. Um, so, you know, throughout the media, we love fear mongering and, you know, all doom and gloom. But despite the seemingly massive problem, it is a, an incredibly quick solution. You know, insects by design um, will bounce back if given the space and opportunity. You know, and giving them the space and opportunity to do so is within everyone's power. You know, as we saw with um, Dave's amazing back garden, you know, just a, a little bit of overgrowth, um, some native plants rather than just, you know, the, the bedding plants that everyone loves to put down, which are largely useless for our pollinators, as despite their beauty, they produce next to no nectar. Um, or, you know, if you, don't have a garden, get involved with your local green spaces um, as this will create a community around nature, um, you know, and pass on the passion to the next generation. Um, and then, you know, by doing so, we'll, we can create advocates to move away from the green deserts that we see around our cities, you know, the tightly mown grass with no wildflowers that is almost too short to harbor any insect life. And this will all help with creating green corridors across the UK, 
that will connect these isolated popul populations and therefore make them more resilient to any of the other pressures um, that we, humanity mounts on them. Um, so yeah, it was a much shorter presentation than the previous one, but you know, I hope through um, this and the previous talk, um, we have fed your passion or even expanded the interest in the natural world that you can then go act on it, you know, and give you the guidance of how to improve our local ecosystems. Thanks, Liam, and thank you, Dave, as well. Um, I'm sure we've all learned so much then. I know I have, especially um, I was definitely um, someone who called things cabbage white, so I've learned from that <laughs> going forward. Um, but I've just popped in the chat as well to everyone. Um, if you are feeling worried about the kind of like decline and stuff that we've discussed, I know at City of Trees we're kind of promoting and encouraging people to get out and do a bit of citizen science, although I'm sure everyone attending this event is definitely already doing that. But if there is little things that you can do, then we all need to be doing it. And I think I'm certainly going to go out and do a little survey um, in the green space opposite me because I don't have a garden at the moment. And it's nice to know that you can still be involved, definitely. All right, so we'll be, we've recorded this session, so we'll be...